I am, as, as um, Kate said, co-founder of Afghan Friends Network, but one of my passions is to advocate for Afghan uh, people, Afghan women, and demystify some of the uh, miscommunication, misunderstanding between our cultures. Um, I'll start off by telling you a little bit about Afghanistan. It's a Central Asian country. Uh, basically, uh, Afghans say that Afghanistan is the heart of Asia. So if you are to take a map of Asia, Afghanistan is located where a human heart would be. Uh, it is uh, bordered by Pakistan on the east, uh, Iran in the west, and Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan in the north. So it's very central to uh, what used to be the Silk Road, as well as a lot of goings on in uh, uh, Asia right now. Um, Afghanistan's population is around 30 million people, and 40% uh, of that population is under the age 14. Um, the literacy rate for Afghan uh, women is around 24%. And for around uh, for Afghan men, it's around 45 percent. Um, there is around 8 percent uh, access or adop ad adoption of internet for uh, Afghan youth. And part of the reason that it hasn't expanded greatly is because of lack of access to electricity, to the internet. But it is one of the booming industries, um, both. Uh, uh, wireless phones as well as the internet uh, and with the population with such a young uh, age I think there's a lot of opportunity to connect with Afghans through uh, social media uh, so my I'm going to go through a very quick hundred year history of Afghanistan specifically uh, by explaining to you what has happened to women in the country I'm not going to talk about the wars and the economic issues and such, um, although they're all very intertwined. Uh, but this will give you an idea of why things are the way they are today and how the uh, US occupation of Afghanistan um, has affected women's lives and what I think will be happening in the future. Uh, basically, I'll start out in 1919, which is when one of the most um, uh, modern kings of Afghanistan took over. Um, king Amanullah was um, married to Queen Surya, who was an educated woman. She is a, was a college graduate. Her father was a poet. He promoted education uh, for um, girls. And so this couple actually um, worked very hard to promote women's education. Um, they discouraged polygamy. The first women's uh, newspaper was established during this time. Unfortunately, the modernization was going too fast uh, for a country that was predominantly um, uh, farmland and with a large percentage of uh, uneducated people. So uh, there was an uprising against King Amanullah and he had to abdicate. And for the next five years, the king who took over basically um, uh, took the country back quite a lot, uh, both in its modernization efforts, took away a lot of women's rights. Um, and uh, he was basically trying to uh, appeal to the tribal uh, communities who were against the fast move movement of modernization. Um, in 1933, King Zaire Shah uh, was uh, um, made president of, uh, oh, sorry, king of Afghanistan at age 17. 17 or 19? <laughs> um, and um, he uh, was actually, the time that he reigned, 1933 to 73, was a time of uh, um, slow but sustained progress in Afghanistan. He did encourage um, women to attend university and as of 1957. Uh, not only did women graduate, but they were accepted in the workforce. Uh, women were allowed to unveil. They no longer had to wear the burqa. So the burqa is not a creation of the Taliban. It's been in the country for a long time. Uh, in 1964, women were uh, allowed to vote, um, which 
is I think would be surprising for a lot of people because there are some countries in the Middle East who still don't allow people to vote, like Saudi Arabia. Um, well, technically you can, uh, women. Uh, and in 1972, the first Afghan um, beauty pageant was held, uh, held. And the winner, winner of that beauty pageant lives in LA now. So um, <laughs> that was big, big progress for Afghanistan. Um, but still, we are talking about what I just cited was in Kabul and some in Herat and a little bit in the northern part of Afghanistan. But the rest of the country was still quite rural and women did not go to school and there was uh, the uh, literacy rate was still quite low. This is actually a picture of my mom that you see up here, looking quite sexy in her off-the-shoulder sweater. <laughs> and uh, she was 19 years old there. And um, this was inside the house. that She was dressed that way. She didn't go outside that way. Um, in 1973, um, King Zahir Shah was uh, basically uh, deposed of his uh, uh, rule by his cousin, Daoud Khan who declared Afghanistan a democratic republic and he called himself president. Uh, his rule was five for five years, but he was very progressive. He wanted Afghanistan to catapult you know, centuries and, and move towards European um, development. He actually um, was so, he felt that education was very important for the youth, so he solicited a lot of scholarships for uh, boys and girls to go to different countries. So for example, my aunt uh, got a scholarship to study fashion design in France, and uh, my uncle got a scholarship to study sculpture in uh, Perugia, Italy. So, and also they sent people to the United States, um, uh, Germany, uh, Russia. Um, and all these countries were pouring money into Afghanistan, rebuilding and such. But what he was doing in this process of modernization was um, creating a big uh, class uh, divide. A lot of Afghans were uh, that were close to the royal family were getting wealthy and there was a group of intellectuals who were moving towards socialist beliefs and that was also influenced by uh, Russians accepting students in Russia and, and educating them in communist uh, dogma. So there was a, a coup d'etat in 1978 and uh, uh, Daoud Khan and around 23 members of his family were brutally killed in the uh, Arg Palace. Um, and there were two of his very young grandchildren who were toddler age who were massacred on that mm -hmm. day as well. So it was a very sad day for Afghanistan. And actually, I still lived there. And that was, I remember that day quite well. Um, so when the communists came uh, into power, that's when the country uh, went into big turmoil because all the communist ideology was against Afghan culture as well as um, the Islamic uh, beliefs. So um, for the first year, it was just the Afghan Communist Party that was running the country. But after that, um, the Russian uh, troops marched in Afghanistan. And I was there um, for uh, the, the marching of the Russian uh, troops, and then we left shortly after that. Um, but the Russians coming into Afghanistan was a very difficult time for Afghans, uh, partially because Afghanistan had not been very friendly to outside occupiers. Um, so this was a big, uh, both ideological issue for Afghan people, as well as uh, religious and tribal issue. So that's when the Mujahideen formed. And uh, when the Soviets came to Afghanistan, it really was the first time that was good for Afghan women, believe it or not, because they abolished um, child marriage. They uh, made it mandatory for all, all girls to go to school. Uh, they really encouraged girls to take leadership position and such. However, at the same time, 
they were massacring thousands of Afghans in um, uh, the uh, outskirts of Kabul and the different provinces. Uh, people were being imprisoned and tortured. There was um, uh, a big uh, exodus of refugees out of Afghanistan. Around two million people left the country. They went to uh, Pakistan and Iran. And then there were people like my family who uh, came to the United States. There was a large number of refugees that went to Europe, Australia. And that was because all of us uh, were not able to live in the country. For example, my father was uh, imprisoned um, just because he worked for uh, uh, the government during Dalit Khan's time. So there was no rhyme or reason for a lot of what was happening in the country except for moving the communist agenda forward. Um, and during this time, uh, there was a huge economy of uh, war that was being created in our neighboring country, Pakistan, which had the largest uh, refugee uh, population. And that was through the funding that came from the United States and Saudi Arabia for the Mujahideen. Their Mujahideen means freedom fighters, and they were fighting for the country of Afghanistan to bring it back to a Muslim, uh, to turn it back into a Muslim country. Of course, there were a lot of economic uh, um, incentives involved with that, as well as the fact that Afghans are very, very um, uh, proud of being an independent uh, uh, country. So having the Russians there was not acceptable. Um, the US war in Afghanistan, or to support the Afghan Mujahideen fighting the United States, um, I believe reached around $15 billion, where money was being sent through the Pakistani ISI. So what was happening to the women during this process? Well, a large number of the refugees that went to Pakistan, they only lived in camps. All their men went to fight with the Mujahideen, and the men, women were left with their small young children. And they lived under very difficult circumstances. And neither Pakistan nor um, uh, Iran really accepted the Afghan uh, refugees as part of their society. There were a lot of restrictions put on these refugees. For example, they couldn't have bank accounts. They couldn't um, do regular work. So it really left uh, uh, a lot of hardship on the women while their men were out fighting. And majority of the women lost sons and, and husbands and such. Uh, well, finally, the Russians could no longer stay in Afghanistan. There was the Geneva Accord. The Russians um, were defeated and they left uh, Afghanistan. And well, all of a sudden, Afghanistan had no leadership. No one was there to uh, run the country. So the nine Mujahideen factions came into Kabul all at once, and they tried to seize power. And for the next five years, Afghanistan had civil war. And that was devastating to the Afghan women um, because there was no economic uh, progress. All the schools had been <coughs> shut down. There were no jobs. And all that was happening was all these different factions killing themselves, each other, as well as looting, raping. So this was a really dark time for Afghan women. And um, out of, I, I explained that there were these tents where the Afghan women were living with their children in Pakistan on the border. Well, out of that group is what was born the Taliban. Those boys who lived in poverty and whose fathers went and fought eventually grew up and they became the Taliban in the religious schools that were supplied. Uh, to uh, the refugees that were uh, in the borders. And it was a very extreme Wahhabi type of religion. So just when you thought that things couldn't get worse for Afghan women, I mean, it did. It got worse when the Taliban came 
Um, all the schools uh, for girls were shut down, um, or what was left open was shut down. Women were not allowed to work. They weren't allowed to leave the country. And those are basically um, the dark years of Afghanistan. Um, now, I've been given uh, my, my warning okay. to... <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so the, in 2009-11 happened, and um, with the U.S. Uh, coming into Afghanistan, uh, the Taliban were ousted. And um, that is when the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan was started. And um, s looking back, uh, there were a lot of promises made to the Afghan women. Um, U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell said that restoring women's human rights would not be negotiable. Prime Minister Tony Blair promised we will not walk away as the outside world has done met so many times. So these are the promises that were given to Afghan women. And, and Afghans actually believed it. Um, but the progress has not gone as smoothly as uh, was hoped, despite the billions of dollars uh, that has been poured into the Afghan war. However, Afghans are tired, sick and tired of the war, and a lot of really amazing women have come forward um, to uh, take their uh, role in and be center state. For example, um, uh, a pilot in the Air Force. The previous photo was uh, a runner in the Olympics. And uh, we currently, in Afghanistan, um, there's 25% of the parliamentary seats have to be held by Afghan um, women. So um, there are 406 uh, females in the parliamentary section of uh, Afghanistan that are voted from their provinces. and. Currently, 30% of the government employees in Kabul are women. Um, and, and that, I have to say, is from the direct involvement of uh, the West as well as some of the projects that have moved things forward. Uh, over 20 million people now have access to mobile phones, um, and 70% of the population watches television and nearly 95% of people have access to radio. You have to remember, just in 2001, no one had access to television. <laughs> no one had a single cell phone. So this is a tremendous progress and actually a huge industry in Afghanistan. 80% um, of the pop, 18% of the population has access to reliable electricity and 60 percent of Afghans have access to basic health, which I think is wonderful. There are a lot of mobile clinics in the province and such. Uh, life expectancy has increased from 44 years to 60 years. And um, maternal, uh, uh, mortality, maternal mortality rate has um, uh, declined uh, quite a bit. So I just feel that there, we have to recognize all the positive things that have happened for Afghan women. And we, uh, due to that progress, we have a lovely representative here. Uh, so, but not everything has gone as smoothly as uh, we hoped. Uh, Afghanistan has one of the most modern uh, uh, constitution in Asia, but the laws are not necessarily enforced because there isn't a fully trained police force and the Afghan National Army is still being developed. Um, here I have a photo of uh, people, uh, women who uh, were crying over a mob beating of an Afghan girl uh, that happened last spring where she had gone to a mosque and she was accused of burning the Quran because she said something that the mullah didn't agree with. And in the city of Kabul, with all these hipster looking guys on camera, she was brutally 
beaten for a whole hour and then finally burned to death. Um, I went to her memorial area in the city of Kabul, which has now become a shrine. I went there in April. And what I'm really impressed by is that people, women, stood up for her and they spoke and they, uh, you know, asked the uh, president to do something about it. But then again, you have to think that this kind of brutality happened to this girl in the middle of the public and nobody stopped it, including the police. So, um, Although there are four million girls going to school in Afghanistan, but the majority of the girls stop going to school after the age 14. Uh, a lot of schools are closing due to insecurity and um, uh, problems that are happening in the provinces. Um, there's a major economic downturn in the country. Uh, around 40% of the population is uh, unemployed. And what I found really disturbing when I went there in April was that ISIS is taking a strong hold. And um, the things that ISIS does in Afghanistan makes the Taliban seem like they're, you know, Mickey Mouse. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are really brutal. Mm -hmm. And a majority of them are not Afghan, so they do not respect the Afghan culture or Afghan people. And I know sometimes it can get confusing between ISIS and Al-Qaeda and Taliban. Uh, but for the Afghans, when you talk to them, the um, uh, surgeons of ISIS is a big, big problem. And if those 14-year-olds, the, the, the children that I was talking about, don't get an education, they don't get to go to school, they will eventually be forced to join the Taliban or ISIS. So it is very important that we don't abandon the country. <coughs> so what we've learned is that Afghan women have suffered, but they're quite resilient. They've been able to pick things up off the ashes and, and continue their, their lives. And uh, one of the things that I'm really impressed by every time I go is the spirit of the Afghan people and the spirit of the Afghan women. And um, despite all that they've gone through, they're still smiling. And look at her, she's so happy. Um, but in order to move the country forward, really, uh, economic development is a big part of it. Uh, vocational training, so both for men and women. There are a lot of jobs that women can do from their homes. Like, for example, fix cell phones or do some kind of uh, uh, work with their hands that they wouldn't necessarily, if they can't leave, to go to uh, school uh, or to go to work. Uh, gender equality, and by that I don't mean what what gender equality means to us here, but an Afghan form of gender equality where women have the choice to make decisions for themselves, um, that women should be able to give in um, a similar right to a certain job than a man. Um, but I think you know, equal pay or some of the things that we consider here is kind of at the far reach at this point, but I think that it's an important part of moving the country to a civil society. Um, and we all have, we can play a role in, in what happens, not in, with just with Afghanistan, but with Syria, with Iraq and such, by being aware, um, understanding the cultural differences and cultural priorities. 